everybody, it's Lisa here from The Painted Pineapple and I am here to talk to you about preparing your pieces prior to painting them. There's a lot of misconception and different ways of preparing your pieces and we wanted to talk to you guys about best practices that we do in the shop before we paint. So first of all, I'd like to say that furniture is one word, but it could be made of many different types of materials. So the piece that you just assembled and brought home from a big box store compared to maybe a mahogany trunk that you dug out of the basement, curbside find, maybe it's your oak cabinetry, especially that one that's above the stove. They all have different finishes. They've lived in different environments and all of those things should be considered prior to painting. Also the species of wood, if it is wood, if it's a manufactured wood, is it a thermofoil or a laminate? Maybe it's melamine. So these are things that all have different considerations that you should look at before you put your brush to your piece of furniture. So I'm going to show you our very minimum basic preparation is cleaning your piece. So this piece I have here is an older telephone table. It is mahogany. But what I would like to show you guys is a few things that we consider good uh, cleaners. So you can go with a TSP traditional TSP. You can also use something like a spray nine. So basically you're looking for a cleaner that is going to degrease and not add any extra oils into it. So there are a lot of cleaners on the market, especially natural ones that have essential oils in there and that you absolutely don't want because you don't want to be adding any extra oil to your surface. We also have um, what we use in the shop, TSP Alternative, which is a little bit of a, a safer formulation to use. But whatever you do decide to use, make sure that you're reading the label and that you are following the directions on the packaging. So for this, I've just poured myself a little bowl of warm water. I'm going to put a couple of capfuls of the Fusion TSP Alternative in here. And this is a very concentrated product, so you have a lot in a bottle. If you were working with something a little bit harsher, you could or should put some gloves on, especially if you're working with a true TSP. And so I just have a basic little kitchen scrubby and I'm going to go ahead and just start scrubbing this piece. I'm just going to give it a good clean all over. Now if this piece were a kitchen door, for example, you may even want to get in there with a toothbrush. I often say in the store, pretend you're a hygienist when you're cleaning and your pieces will last you a really long time. You don't have to do this on something such as this piece, but in a kitchen where you've got extra grease and airborne greases and things, I would absolutely do that. So that I would consider a fairly good clean. You're gonna wanna go back and wipe off this. If you were using something that was a non-rinse uh, or a, a rinsed formula. Some of them are non-rinse where you don't have to do this. But if you were using um, traditional TSP or Spray 9, I would dampen your cloth and make sure you remove all of the residue because that'll be really important. So something I do want to show you on this piece, when I cleaned it earlier, I noticed, and I'm not sure if you can see, but even after I cleaned that, there was a little bit of residue left behind. As I take my fingernail and scrape it along, you can see some marks in here where this would have been um, years of buildup of perhaps lemon oil or pledge or some type of a furniture polish, which carries, um, it'll be made of silicone or waxes, things like that. You wanna make sure you get as much of that off, if not all of it off, so that you're painting on a very clean substrate. So. What you can do if you find that you're not able to remove waxes or oils is you can go in with an odorless solvent or a mineral spirit. And I'll show you what that looks like. This you'd also want to wear gloves, potentially also a mask, because it is, even though it's odorless, even if you crack the window open a little bit, just because it is um, a chemical product. So you're gonna wipe it all over and this will start to break down the silicone or the wax or the oils that are built up on there. And then you're going to want to go back in with a clean cloth and wipe that off best you can. And sometimes you may need to do a couple of rotations of this, so a couple of cycles to actually break through the waxes or the oils. Now, this isn't necessary on the majority of pieces, but this is what I discovered on this one. And a lot of pieces that you'll find from anywhere from the 50s straight through to the 80s, um, 
will have some type of film built up on it, typically. That's looking much cleaner. So once your piece is clean and dry, so you do want it to be dry, you don't want the wood to have absorbed any water. So for instance, if there's any open grain in your pieces um, and the water penetrates, you want to make sure that the piece has dried out before you move on to uh, scuff sanding. So I've just taken basically a 220 and I'm just going to lightly go across the surface and that's that. So basically what I'm looking to do is degloss the piece. So it's just taking that finish off, gives the piece a little bit of tooth to work with, and it's also taken down some of that wax that's there as well, and it's looking really good. Again, I'm going to clean on the front, which I've done, a little bit of a scuff sand. So I always like to say, you're not breaking into an aerobic activity here, this is just a light scuff. And that is going to give you a clean surface. So for the most part, you're good to go to start painting. Or are you? So now that we've talked about cleaning your piece with TSP and a light scuff sand, we're going to look at surfaces or materials that may require a little extra help. This one in particular would be a thermofoil or a manufactured wood, um, which actually it's very slick when you feel it. Um, it. It's something that typically doesn't want to accept paint. So what I'm going to show you here is if your paint does this, so it's something called uh, lacing or threading, there's different terms for it. So basically when you lay your paint down, what it will want to do is start pulling back on itself. It's starting to a little bit here. I'm gonna go into another section. So right in here, you'll start to see how the paint is looking like there's little dots coming through it. And those are some areas where the paint actually doesn't want to adhere. So something like this is when you would want to consider using a high adhesion, a high adhesion primer, or perhaps even uh, something like Fusion's Ultra Grip, which is a water-based product, which would be applied first, and then it would be left for at least 12 hours before paint was applied on top of it. Sometimes we inherit pieces that have been previously painted. Maybe we've done them ourselves, but maybe we've purchased something and we're not really sure what the surface, existing surface is or what it's been painted in. So the good thing about most paints is that you can uh, paint right on top of what you've done. Um, you wanna make sure that you go in again and do your clean, so TSP, Give it a really good clean. You wanna make sure that you're getting off any dirt because what happens is if there's any dirt left behind, any grease, any little dried on bits of ketchup, anything at all, is what's gonna happen is that's gonna present itself like a little ridge. And when you paint, you're painting right on top of that. And if that little bit of ketchup decides to fly away, it's going to take the paint with it. So you want to be able to clean as much as you can straight down to the surface. So this piece here, I can see that there's been paint dripped on it. It's been used as kind of a work table. So I'm actually going to go in here with a scraper and get that little bit off. So you can see that would have presented itself as a ridge that eventually would have come off. And also on this piece, I can see that however it was painted before, it didn't really want to bond very well. So I am getting some loose paint. So if you ever have any loose or chipping paint from a piece, you want to really instigate it to come off. So any loose paint on anything at all, you want to try scraping it, sanding it with a palm sander or even hand sanding to try and smooth out those ridges. Because if this paint isn't stable, neither is your new fresh coat of paint. So I'm just going to go in here. This one is actually not coming off with my scraper, so that was probably um, just a ding that happened. So I'm going to smooth sand that down and feather it out until I can't feel any ridge anymore. If you've got a big layer of paint that's chipped off and you can feel any kind of um, scarring in the wood with your fingertips, you'll be able to see that when you paint. So you may want to go in with a wood filler, fill it in, and then smooth sand it. Do not trust your eyes, they will lie to you every time. Look away and feel. And if you can feel that there's a little bit of a dip there, sure enough, when you paint it, you're going to see it. So those are some tips for working on previously painted pieces. 
And next up, we're going to look at species of wood. Something else that's really important to consider is what type of wood you're actually painting. So some of us have heard of bleed through before, specifically with knots in newer pieces of softwood and raw, raw pine, for example. So this piece here, you can kind of see where the knots, the resin in the knots have actually bled through this paint. And it gives you these almost nicotine colored stains that come through. A lot of us have seen this on trim work in our house. Um, lots of exterior painted pieces, but it can also happen with oak and mahogany and cherry. Uh, those are the three in particular that do like to bleed. And even if they have had a varnish or a shellac applied to them, sometimes that tannin in the wood, or it could even be the stain in the dye that they used at the time, can permeate the water-based paint and actually show up on the surface, leaving a very unattractive stain. So the only thing that really solves this problem is going in with a true shellac or a shellac based primer. So this is the product that we use regularly. It's made by Zinzer Bin and it is the shellac based formula. So this one is actually tinted white. So if you're painting in lighter colors, this one is absolutely fantastic. Um, we recommend at least two coats, but sometimes what you'll see, particularly on older mahogany pieces when you start painting them, is that you may get pink stains come up. Just keep applying the bin until the pink subsides and you're left with a white finish. So this dries very quickly and it smooth sands really nice too. So it provides a really nice finish before you start to apply your paint. If you want to keep the natural wood underneath or you're gonna be doing any distressing and you don't wanna see white, you can actually use just the straight up shellac and you wanna use the clear. There's also um, a, an amber formulation as well, but you'll wanna go in with the clear one. This comes in a spray as well. So if you had something that had a lot of knots in it, you could just kind of hit the knots with your spray, give them a couple of coats and that would prevent the resin from coming out. So typically to recap, if you're working with mahogany, cherry, or oak, those are notorious bleeders, but you shouldn't have problems typically with a maple or a birch. So those are some tips to help you. And you can always, if you decide that you're going to just try your piece first to see if you're going to get bleed, sometimes it can take uh, up to several months before you actually start to see that migration of the tannin come through. So if you are working with a cherry, oak, or, or um, mahogany, I would recommend you just go straight for it, apply the bin with shellac base to it, and you're going to have a perfect finish every time.